for over a year now where we've been walking through the book of Luke and uh, titled the series The Boundaryless Gospel. We've been following along as Jesus is willing to save anybody and then wants to save everybody. And uh, But on a day like Resurrection Sunday, Easter, you know, it, you can't just keep going through a series preaching about something. Right? You've got to preach about the resurrection, about the cross. And so... Uh, I prayed where to be, and, and I was a little upset because God led me back to the book of Luke. I was, hoping, I was trying to use Matthew and Mark, or maybe even John, and God led me back to Luke. So if you would turn to Luke chapter 23, we aren't, this is not a part of our series. I suppose I'll get to verse, or chapter 23 in the next year or so, but uh, we're in chapter 23 this morning, Luke chapter 23. Matthew's the first book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, then Luke, so it would be the third book of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke. We're only going to read a few verses today. We're going to give you more of the, the grand story, but for the sake of time, I'm, I'm, I'm only going to read a few verses, which is a little strange for me. And uh, that's okay, though. We'll, we'll, bear, we'll get through it this morning. If you would please stand in honor of God's Word if you found your place there in Luke chapter 23. And uh, you say, why we stand? I, well, because in the Old Testament, when the reading of God's Word happened, they would stand in honor of God's Word. And so we try to, we try to give reverence that this Word, uh, it is a living Word, and the Word was made flesh and, and uh, lived among us. So we try to give it as much honor as possible, so we stand, and that's why. Luke chapter 23, look at verse 46. Verse 46. The Bible says, And when Jesus had cried... And the, I'm sorry, and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having thus said, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And all the people that came together to that sight, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. And all his acquaintance and the women that followed uh, him from Galilee stood afar off beholding these things. That's where we'll end our reading this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you again. And I don't know if we can thank you enough for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins, raising him from the dead three days later. So Lord, thank you for that, God. As we open up your word, I'm, I'm asking, Lord, that you would speak to the hearts of these people here today. We have some that may have never heard the gospel, possibly. Maybe some that have never trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And Lord, we for sure have those that are saved that are neglectful of Jesus Christ and his word and what he wants in our lives. So Lord, I ask that you speak to our hearts. God, be with me as I preach. I need your help this morning. Empty me of self, fill me with the Holy Spirit. It's all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. Titled the message this morning, How Will You React? How will you react? I've heard it said that life is 20% action and 80% reaction. Now, I don't know how accurate that is, but basically that saying is trying to inform us that about 20% of the things we do is of our own free will and volition. We do it because we desire to do it. But 80% of the things we do is, in fact, a reaction to something else that has happened to us or happened to somebody around us. Does that make sense? Is that 80, 20? Um, I know it at least seems true when I think about it. Maybe if you really give it some thought, you'd, you'd think, yeah, it probably is true. Most of the things I do are a reaction. Um, I do take action in my life. Praise the Lord for free will. I'm glad that he gave it to us. And, you know, when I am laying in bed and it's, say, around midnight and my stomach growls, and I proceed to get up and go to the freezer and get that quart of ice cream out of the freezer, and then proceed to eat the entire quart of ice cream, that was an action I decided to take. That was of my own free will because I wanted to. My stomach growled and I thought, I want to eat. But now if my wife and I are in bed and I'm perfectly content and she says to me, she's cold. And I proceed, even though I'm not cold, to get out of the bed and go turn off the fan. Well, that's a reaction. She obviously has me well trained since 
I don't argue or anything. I don't tell her, well, go turn off the fan. I just, I don't know how it happens. I don't even realize it's happened, but she's got me so trained that as a reaction, she says, I'm cold and I go turn off the fan. Say your neighbor buys a brand new truck. Ooh, is it nice. You go by and check it out as he's got it in the driveway and new truck. He says, oh yeah, it's the limited or it's the platinum or it's the lariat or it's the laramie. You know, they always got a badge and a name for all the special trucks and you go over and look at it and you decide that truck is so nice. Got to get one myself. So you buy a truck. Well, that was a reaction. You didn't want that truck. You didn't even think about that truck until you saw that truck up close and personal. Your neighbor had it. So you thought I've got to have it. That's a reaction. Um, maybe this has happened at work. You see somebody, and I hate these people. No, I'm just kidding. I don't hate them, but I don't like them. You see those people that suck to the boss. Uh, brown nosers, what, what you call them, even though it's kind of rude to say, but you know, brown nosers or whatever. And yet, you think, well, that's not going to do them any good. And then the time for a promotion or a raise comes around and they get one. So you say, well, pff, I guess if I want a promotion or a raise, I got to start sucking up to the boss. And so you begin to suck up to the boss. Why? That was a reaction. If you want to be honest, most of our life is reaction to something. Most of our life is reaction to something or someone. Where you live, where you work, how you raise your kids, even the reason you are here today was probably a reaction. It might have been because I texted you yesterday. It might have been because you're afraid I'd text you tomorrow. <laughs> reaction. In our passage that God had pointed out to me and kind of brought something to light that I'd never seen, uh, we're kind of jumping into the middle of a story. But in the middle of this story, we'll, we'll cover the, the, the broader scope of it in a minute. I saw something that caught my eye. After Jesus dies, we get to see the reaction of three different groups of people. Three different groups of people, we see their reaction to the, the last and the dying breath of Jesus Christ. So look back at the passage with me. And so, as I said, we kind of jumped right into the middle of the story. And I'll, I'll cover what has passed, what has transpired, and what's coming up. Uh, but what we've jumped into in verse number 46 is Jesus' very last words and His very last breath. It says this in verse 46, And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, He said, and, and I didn't say it loud enough when I read, so I'm going to say it real loud now. You say, why is that? He said he cried aloud. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having, and having said this, he gave up the ghost. So we jumped right into Jesus' death. Well, um, we'll cover what's all going on in a minute. But no matter who dies, who's ever seen somebody pass away? I know this is kind of morbid this morning, but uh, many, many people have has been witness. I've myself been witness to uh, people pass away. And it's, it doesn't really matter who it is. If it's somebody that's very close to you or somebody that's not that close to you, to see someone take their last and dying breath kind of has an effect on you, doesn't it? Kind of starts making you think about mortality maybe or just what, what your life has amounted to or, you know, I don't know what all you goes through your head. Um, usually I think, I'm glad I'm in my 20s. <laughs> That's usually what I think. Um, but at the same time, I realize that it doesn't matter if you're in your 20s, you can still, I can still get in a car crash and be dead. I can still be struck by lightning, which is maybe a little more rare, but I could still get struck by lightning and die at 28 or whatever. And so uh, imagine being there and watching this death. Seeing this death, it, it, it's going to have an effect on everyone present, whether they liked Jesus or not. And so we get to now look at the reaction of some people that were there, that for themselves saw Jesus speak His very last words and take His very last breath. The first one is there in verse 47. It says, Now when the centurion saw, that, saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly... This was a righteous man. Now, a centurion very simply was a soldier, a Roman soldier. And so, uh, Brother Nathan, could you come here for a second help me? Just for uh, illustration's sake. So, you, you get to be the centurion. I'm going to be Jesus only because I'm on the platform so I can pretend. So, you be the centurion. Stand right here. So, this is the centurion. And he would be the person that was closest in proximity to Jesus Christ. He would have been the person that was guarding the base of the cross. You say, why? 
Well, because he wanted to make sure nobody would come and try to get Jesus off, try to save Jesus, try to, you know, there's a lot of Jews there. And as a Roman soldier, you had no idea what was about to go down. It was actually a very high stressful thing, even for the soldiers, even though they've done many of crucifixions, many of people they've hung on the cross. Uh, I'm sure they'd never hung somebody on the cross like Jesus Christ. Thank you. You can be seated. So this would have been, the, the centurion was a person that was the closest to Jesus Christ. He very well may have been somebody that helped beat Jesus Christ. He may have been somebody that helped hurt. Uh, hurt or punch or abuse Jesus Christ. He may have been somebody that helped nail his hands and his feet to the cross. He may have been somebody that helped lift the cross and have it drop into its hole. He could have been very active in everything that happens. And as he is there and he witnesses all that is happening, Jesus gives up the ghost. By the way, that's a very key phrase, gave up the ghost, because Jesus did not have his life taken from him. If somebody walks in here and shoots me, they took my life from me. I have no choice. I'm dead. It's done. Well, unless they shoot me somewhere that's not fatal, obviously. But for the illustration's sake, let's say I die, okay? I didn't, I didn't choose to give up my life. Somebody took it. Jesus gave up his life. And he said, if I give it up, I can get it back. And we find out here in a little bit, he does. Just that. So that's a very key phrase that he gave up the ghost. He willingly laid his life down for you and for me. And that's critical. Anyway, so this, this centurion that would have been the, the closest to him, front row seats for those last... Bloody gurgling breaths. You say, how do you know it's bloody and gurgling? Well, he was torn to shreds and then hung on a cross. The whole point of it, the cross is not so that you just die in front of everybody on a pedestal. It's so that you die of suffocation and choking on your own blood. And so he heard those last dying breaths after he proclaimed to the Father, as he says here, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. As he sees this, it struck a nerve in his heart. As I said, most likely, this man helped kill Jesus Christ. I don't know how many people are remorseful after they do their job and help kill somebody. I don't know how often that is, but he looks up and it says he glorified God. That's very important. This, this changed something in him. This changed something inside of him. Deep inside, he knew something was different about this man. And then he says in verse number 47, Certainly, this was a righteous man. In other of the Gospels, it says that he said, certainly this is the Son of God. So you can use them all. Maybe he said all of it, and Luke records part of it, and Matthew records another part of it. Either way, he said, this is a righteous man, this is the Son of God. After he's dead, he realized, I made a mistake. God, this is your Son. This was a righteous man. And by the way, I'm glad that Jesus Christ isn't just a righteous man, that he is son, God the Son, because a righteous man dying for me isn't really going to do me much good. The Son of God, perfect, sinless Son of God, a lamb without spot or blemish dying for me, can do something for me. So that was the first person, the centurion. So don't forget about the centurion. If it helps, picture Brother Nathan standing here. Now, oh, by the way, he had no idea how pointless his job actually was. I'm serious. Jesus gave up his life. Jesus willingly was on the cross. And he was there to protect and make sure nothing happened and Jesus actually died. But at any point in time, Jesus could have called 10,000 angels and that soldier would have been in a world of hurt. He would have been pointless. He, his whole job would have been pointless. It would have all been over for him. But uh, that's not what God wanted. That's not what Jesus wanted. So, so we have the centurion. By the way, uh, just acknowledging... That Jesus is, was the Son of God, or just acknowledging that Jesus is a righteous man, is not enough to get you into heaven. Now, we don't know. Maybe this centurion later on, maybe even in Acts, gets saved. We don't, we don't know what happened to this centurion. We have no details. Maybe later on, this planted a seed that was watered later on in Acts, and maybe he gets saved. It's possible. But right there, I'm telling you, he wasn't saved just because he acknowledged and glorified God and said, Yep, that was your son. That was a righteous man. It didn't, it didn't change anything for him. Now, verse 48 would technically be the next group of people, but that's where I really want to labor this morning. And so let's go into verse 49 and look at the, the third group, uh, which we're going to talk about second, but it would be the third group there. And uh, read verse 49 with me. It says, And all his acquaintance and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off beholding these things. And so you have first the centurion. The guy that is closest in proximity to the cross. And then you have in the crowd the group of people that were acquaintances of Jesus Christ. That's just a very general term for somebody that knew Jesus Christ. Who was in, who was in this group? Well, his mother Mary was actually in this group. 
We know that because while he was on the cross, he told John basically, this is your mother. And he told his mother, this is your son, basically saying, take care of my mom. By the way, that shows something about Jesus Christ. Dying a brutal death, he was still thinking about others. By the way, if he actually was thinking about himself, he would have called those 10,000 angels the entire time he was on that cross dying and, and suffering. He was thinking about you. I know that's hard to believe. You say, oh, I wasn't even born 2,000 years ago. I, my great, 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 great grandpa wasn't even born 2,000 years ago. And yet Jesus and God knew that in 2021, you'd be sitting here today. He knew and he was thinking of you. And so there, this is the group, including his mother. And there'd be the other Mary there. And there's other women that had been following Jesus. It says since Galilee. So they've been, they've, even though they may not be ever talked about, they've always been in the crowd. They've always been watching Jesus do all the things that he's been doing. They've always watched Jesus do his miracles. They love Jesus. And so here they are. Now it says that they're standing afar off. I want to take time to say, I don't believe this is because they were like, well, we don't really care. You know, what's going on over there is not a big deal. No, I think that, my personal opinion, this isn't the Bible, this is what I believe. I believe as people, have you ever been in a crowd where people want to get to the front of the crowd to see what's happening? I believe as people were rushing to get closer to the, to the cross, rushing to get closer to see Jesus die, it would have pushed these women, because most of them were women, that's who it was men, I, I'm sure there were some men there too, uh, but we know at least it was women, I'm sure it kind of forced these women to get a back row seat. Macro seat, because these other people want to see Jesus die. And so we have the centurion that would have been closest. We have a group of people that knew Jesus Christ. They would have been uh, afar off, but they still, this was, I mean, this was their Savior. There was no doubt in their mind that this was the Son of God. They didn't say like the centurion after he died, oh, certainly this is the righteous man, certainly this is the Son of God. No, they knew as they watched him suffer, they knew that's Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior of all mankind. That is Him. And as Jesus died, we don't, it, the, the Bible doesn't really record their action, but I guarantee it was sorrow. Maybe even as the song that I sang talks about, maybe they even wondered why did He have to die like this? Why did it have to be so brutal? Why, why did it have to be... They, they knew Jesus well enough, and yet they're looking at His face, and they don't recognize Him at all because He's so beaten and battered. And they may have wondered why. Either way, we know that they were sorrowful. But here's the group I really want to focus on this morning. And that's the group that's in verse number 48. Verse number 48. It says this, And all the people that came together to that site... So, uh, very simple here. The Bible is, doesn't try to confuse us. It says, all the people. What does that mean? It means, aside from the centurion, aside from the acquaintances of Christ, everybody else. Okay? This is a large crowd, by the way. You say, why is it a large crowd? Well, very simply because this was the Passover time. And many people would travel in to the, for the Passover, and they'd stay and celebrate the Passover, and it was something that they would do uh, every year. And so there was a large, a bigger crowd than normal. So this has been a large crowd. So aside from the centurion, the soldier, we know what he thought, what he said. We know that there was women, and at least maybe a few men that knew Jesus Christ, that were standing far off. And then there's everybody else. Okay, so you're following. This is everybody else. A large crowd of people. I need you to understand that, because that's important. It says this in verse 48, And all the people that came together to that site, beholding the things which were done. Okay, so who's all in the crowd, possibly, that could have been witness to this? Well, I personally believe there's got to be some Pharisees there. Again, I can't prove who's there. It wasn't recorded for a reason. And, and it, uh, but I've I, I got to believe that these Pharisees that wanted Jesus dead for years weren't going to miss Him dying. Let's say you somebody killed one of your children and you know they were going to get the death penalty and, and I'm not going to get into all the laws about the death penalty and why I think they should be there and why we shouldn't get rid of them. Anyways, uh, but they're on, they're on death row and it comes that date where they're going to die. You might want to be there to watch that happen. The person that killed your kid or something like that. Well, they hated Jesus, not because he did something wrong to them, but because they, he made them look bad. He, made them, he embarrassed them a lot. And uh, I don't like to ever get embarrassed personally. And uh, I don't think anybody really does. And so he bears them. And they, were, they had to have been there to witness this. I've got to believe that. Uh, who else was there? Well, like I said, a large grouping of Jews who came for the Passover would have been there. They came for the Passover, but they would never get all that was going to happen. But they stayed to witness it. I've got to believe that. I've got to believe that there's a whole bunch of Roman soldiers. A lot of them. More than normal. Because this isn't just a normal... Um, 
crucifixion where one person's dying and there's maybe two people that are witnessing it and then the few soldiers that are around. This is the biggest event that has happened in ever. And so there's a lot of Roman soldiers. So this is a large gathering of people. I understand this. A lot of people. Okay, so we got a lot of people there. What exactly did they see that was done? Because it says, again, verse 48, And all the people that came together to that site, so they saw something, which beholding the things which were done. So what exactly did they see that was done? Well, this is a lot of things, actually. And this is how I'm going to kind of give you the whole grand scheme of what has happened. Okay, starting at the beginning. Uh, they wouldn't, most of them, maybe some of the soldiers, but most of them wouldn't have seen uh, Jesus get sold out by one of his disciples for some silver. But maybe some of the soldiers did. They would have saw, they would have been there to see Jesus go through some sham trial where they're standing back and all the witnesses' testimonies don't agree. You know, everything everybody's saying is, is, is going contrary to each other. They would have seen this lack of evidence and still this man be convicted with no evidence. They would have seen that. They would have been there to, to, to see that and that has happened. There was a chance that Jesus was going to be released. There was an offer. Look, I'll release Jesus Christ, this man, or I will release this man, Barabbas, that is a murderer and a wicked person. Which one do you want? And they would have been in the crowd. These would have been the people in the crowd that were screaming out, Give us Barabbas! We want that guy. We want the murder killer dude, not the guy that's done nothing wrong, that just went through a sham trial. They would have been there to see that. They saw... Or possibly they were participating in spitting on Jesus and mocking Jesus and grabbing a hold of his beard or his hair or whatever they could get a hold of as he was being uh, drugged through the crowd. They possibly were either a part of it or at least saw other people do that kind of cruelty and that kind of wickedness to him. They would have saw that. They saw him beaten by the soldiers. No, no, they heard the sound of those whips as they wrapped around the flesh. And then they heard the screams and the pains and maybe even the gasps of other people as, as those whips were ripped back and just tore Jesus' flesh to shreds and insides, intestines and things falling out of his, his, his abdominal area. And just they saw and heard, they heard each one of the hits in the face as, he, as his face was beat. They saw and witnessed it all. They saw people cast lots for his clothes. They would have watched the Roman soldiers mockingly thrust a crown of thorns on his head and make fun of him. Oh, you sure are the king of the Jews now, aren't you, Jesus? They watched, they watched and witnessed all of that gruesome sight. They saw him staked to that cross. I don't know what that sound was when that hammer drove those big spikes. And I don't picture little nails. These would have been big railroad spike sized spikes as they were driven into one hand and driven into the other hand. And I don't know what kind of sounds Jesus would have made. I, I can't even imagine what it, if he was, if he'd bear, grin and bear, bared it for our sakes or if he had to let out a scream, we don't know. And then his, both of his feet were stacked and then an, another big crushing boom as it drives his feet into this cross. Oh, but the, the pain and the suffering didn't stop there. They would have seen as the Roman soldiers got that cross lifted vertically. And the way they would do it is they'd, they'd basically dig a big deep hole. And as they lifted that cross up, the cross would drop into the hole. But they did this for two reasons. When, when it dropped, for one, they wanted them stood up for all to see. But whenever it would drop that couple of feet down, as soon as it hit the bottom, bones would break. So they listened to the sounds of bones snapping and breaking the pain coming out of Jesus' mouth, the, the, the tears flowing down his face, the blood running. They would have seen a soldier stab him in the side. They would have heard Jesus say, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Just to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They would have heard Jesus say that. They would have seen Jesus ask John to take care of his mother while he was going through pain that none of us can actually physically imagine. 
They would have seen Jesus forgive the man on the cross next to him and tell him, today you'll be with me in glory and offer forgiveness to the other one. They would have witnessed all that. But aside from what they saw in Jesus, there was a lot that went on, miracles that went on around him. You say, what kind of miracles? Well, how about this? The moment Jesus dies, the world goes black. No, no, no. This isn't, we're not talking like a, a lunar eclipse. There was a lunar eclipse, what, like three years ago or something like that? Everybody remember that? There's a lunar eclipse. I think it was about three years ago. You get special glasses and you can see the moon in front. No, no, we're talking, it is nighttime dark from 12 in the afternoon to 3 in the afternoon. Uh, if that happened, coincidentally, right as this guy dies, I'd say that that probably kind of freaked me out a little bit. This guy gives up his, his, he says, into thy hands I commend my spirit, and then all of a sudden it goes black? Like the sun stops shining? That's a miracle. That's crazy. They would have felt an earthquake. The Bible records for us. You say, well, what if it's a place that commonly got earthquakes? Okay, but again, it happens right around the time this guy dies. And then, coincidentally, graves open up. No, I, okay, uh, where were we that was right? It was y'all's house. It was right by a cemetery uh, down here on Teller 1. Earthquake happens, and then graves open up. You say, well, that, that could happen. Don't, don't try to think too much into this, Mr. Spiritual. If, if there's earthquakes, it could possibly be great. But what is the odds of it being graves of just former believers in Christ? Like, uh, imagine figuring that out after the fact, that everybody that, uh, all the graves that were open were people that believed in Jesus Christ. That's pretty creepy. They watch rocks split in half, like boulders split in half. I've never seen that. Lord willing, I don't see that, because I imagine that means a boulder's falling. <laughs> That's usually the impact when they smell. I don't want to see that. They witnessed all of these things. And then they saw Jesus draw his last painful, labored breath. They witnessed all of that. The Greek word for all is everybody. They all saw it. Keep reading in verse 48. And all the people that came together to that site, beholding the things which were done, next three words there, smote their breasts. What? That's what caught my attention. I was reading through this a while back. I said, what? And I knew I'd read it somewhere else. Oh yeah, I'd read it in Luke chapter 18. Jesus tells a story of a publican and a sinner. And the publican, or the, the or, I'm sorry, publican and a sinner. <laughs> he tells the story of a Pharisee and a publican. And the Pharisee gets up and prays, God, I'm, th I'm so thankful I'm not like that guy. And the publican acknowledges his wickedness and smotes his breast. That's basically all it means. Pounds his chest. So we got to kind of do a little bit of labor here. I saw it in 18, then I saw it here, and I thought, okay, what exactly does that mean? Well, we don't use that gesture anymore. I don't come home, and my wife say, how was today? And I go, you're thinking, good, don't do that. This is weird. Um, we don't use that, so i got to explain it a little bit. So what that meant, that was their way of outwardly showing they were sorrowful and upset. You say, why did they do that? Well, they believe that the heart is the center of emotions. And so by pounding on their heart, they were acknowledging, I'm upset, I'm sorrowful, I'm regretful, I've made a mistake, I'm, I'm sad. One of those things. It would have been, it was a sign of emotion. We don't do it in 2021. Uh, what we do is if we're sorrowful or upset about something, we go and post it on Facebook. And uh, <laughs> hope, hope you don't do that, by the way. Or maybe, maybe, possibly, to show that we're upset about something. Get one of these. <sighs> they didn't catch that one. Hang on. <sighs> they're about to pass out from breathing in so deep. And what they're wanting is for somebody to say, Miss Dieta, what's wrong? That's kind of how we show. So hopefully you don't show sorrow like that. It's kind of annoying if you do. Um, but <laughs> did you just call me annoying from the pulpit? Not you particularly, unless you do that. And then, yes, I very much did. <laughs> So anyways, back to the past. It is a sign of sorrow. So what, what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying, very simply, this is what happens. They watched 
They, they were a part of the crowd that says, crucify him, crucify him. Give us Barabbas. They were part of the crowd that spit on him. They were part of the crowd that ripped his beard out. They were part of the crowd that mocked him. They were part of the crowd that watches the centurions beat him. They were part of the crowd that watches he got crucified. They were part of the crowd that watched. And then as, as they watched all of these things, and then all of these, oh, I forgot to even mention, the temple veil tears from top to bottom when Jesus dies. Now you may not know this, but a temple veil is about as thick as a man's hand. And it takes 300 men to carry that thing. And it tears from top to bottom when Jesus dies. That's a crazy... They witnessed and heard about all these things. And immediately, when it's all done, they finally realize, I messed up. I messed up. I made a mistake! I shouldn't have done that! We shouldn't have killed him! He was innocent! He was righteous! We messed up! By the way, every time I read the story of Jesus Christ and, and His crucifixion, I hope this comes over your mind too. I never neglect to remember the fact that He died for my sins. He died for your sins. And every time, he's on that, every time I read about Him on that cross, or I think about Him on that cross, I remember the fact that I put Him there. So you weren't even alive. That was 2,000 years ago. But my sins are very much alive today. I put Him there. And these crowd that saw it, Man, they're overcome with remorse. They're overcome with emotion. They're overcome by a sense of regret. And they're crying out. And notice, it doesn't say they're, they're smiting each other's chest. They're, they're not saying they're pounding on each other's chest. No, this is very much. every. It says all of them. Does that, is that not what the Bible says? If we believe it's perfect, we've got to believe. Everyone but the centurion and the people that were acquainted with Jesus all pounded their chest acknowledging that I messed up. I made a mistake. We shouldn't have done this. He was innocent. He was righteous. He, 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 he is God. I mean, I would probably start thinking this guy may have been the king of the Jews when the sky goes black for three hours, when rocks begin to split in half, when earthquakes happen, when the veil tears down the middle from top to bottom. I might start understanding, I've made a mistake. This, this is not what I should have done. I shouldn't have said, uh, give us Barabbas. I should have said, give us Jesus. I shouldn't have cried out, crucify him. I shouldn't have been done all those things. I shouldn't have spit on him. I shouldn't have ripped his beard out. I shouldn't have done any of those things. And there's this great, uh, could you imagine? No, I, I mean, picture uh, maybe thousand people or more gathered together, all pounding on their chests, acknowledging, I messed up. That's a scene that I can't even imagine what it looked like. Tears flowing down people's faces probably as they realize, we've made such a mistake. This really, truly was the Messiah and we killed him. But then, unfortunately, the verse doesn't end with smooth their breasts. There's two more words after that. Look at it. It says, I'm going to read the whole verse again. And the people that came together to that site, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. They returned. What are you saying, preacher? Well, um, to return probably means they went back home. They went back to, to wherever they're from. Again, a lot of people traveled in for the Passover. Now they travel back home to Dan and Beersheba and Capernaum and wherever they're from. And they travel back home. Imagine when you get back home with your wife and how was the Passover? You'll never believe it was different than I've ever seen. It was something crazy. It was this man named Jesus Christ who claimed to be king of the Jews died. They, they went back to their normal lives. Some point today, Brother Frank is going to return home, I think. You plan on going home, I hope. That means that's where he came from. Have you ever been to Alaska? Alaska? Okay, we're going to say that. If Brother Frank went to Alaska, he can't say, I'm glad to return to Alaska. I'm glad I'm back because he's never been. So they're going back to where they're from. But, but it, the Bible's trying to tell us a little more. They're going back to their old lives. They're going back as if nothing happened. No, the entire crowd, aside from the centurion and those that actually knew Jesus, are pounding on their chest, acknowledging, we've messed up! And moments later they say, well, alright, what's for dinner tonight? What do you want to do for dinner? You got plans tomorrow? And they all go back to their lives. All this emotion, all of this regret, all of this sorrow, all of this movement, and then nothing changed. Nothing changed. 
the, the closest thing that I can think of, at least in my lifetime, like this is the example of the events that happened after 9-11. It's scary to think that a lot of you weren't in this room, or a lot of young people in the room weren't even born then, but most of us adults remember it. It was a Tuesday, and the events of 9-11 happened. And then you can go, you can go study Barna's research or the research that goes from uh, Pew Research. You'll find out church attendance skyrocketed the next Sunday. Many churches were full to the brim. People that hadn't gone to church in years were all of a sudden in church. Why was that? Because we realize as a country, we've got a real enemy. We realize as a country, we need God. And we all got back to church. Well, if you go back and look at Barna and Pew Research, the spike in church attendance only lasted about two months. But for most people, it lasted that Sunday. And then Monday came along. And they went right back to their old lives. No, they were stirred emotionally by the events that they witnessed. To see the people jumping out of the building. To, see the, to, to hear the scream. They were moved to think that we need God. We are in trouble if we don't get it on, on good terms with God. They were moved. And then nothing really changed. No, go back, look. There was no great revival that happened in 2001. No, by Christmas time, Thanksgiving time, everything was pretty well back to normal aside from the war. It's a lot what happened here. They were so emotionally moved. They just witnessed miracle after miracle. They just witnessed just the, bru the, the most brutal thing that could ever be seen by mankind done to another human. They smote their chest. They, they pounded on their chest and said, I'm wrong! I shouldn't have done it! But if I just get a good night's sleep, I'll forget about it. This, that, was the reaction of the people that saw Jesus die. That saw it happen for themselves. The people reacted to Jesus' death the way they did because they knew that what they had done to Jesus was a mistake and wrong. But they never changed anything. They saw all that happened. They said, I know I've messed up. I'm so sorry for what I've, done, what I've done, God. I can't imagine how many people cried out to God that day and said, God, forgive me. Although they did hear, hear Jesus cry out the same thing from the cross. God, forgive them for they know not what they do. But then they go and return to their normal life. Let me tell you the rest of the story because it, it gets pretty exciting. Now look at chapter 24. You should be almost right there if you were with us. Chapter 24 says, Now upon the first day of the week, that would be Sunday morning, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. That means this big, this giant stone that was probably five feet in diameter around that was rolled in front of the grave and sealed by the centurion showing that this has not been tampered with. That whole stone was moved. They walk, what? The stones? So they run up, maybe, I'm trying to imagine in my mind as they run up, the stones rolled away. Number, verse number 3, And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it came to pass as they were, very mu as, as they were much perplexed thereabout. Uh, you'd be pretty confused too. You came to kind of do some other things to his body, some certain spices, and all of a sudden there is no body. What, what did the Romans do with his body? This is the tomb that Joseph of Arimathea that we put him in. This is where he was. Where is his body? And they were so confused. Keep reading. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? <laughs> Why are you looking for somebody that's alive here in a, in a cemetery? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee. Remember, most of these women saw him die, been following him since Galilee. And the Bible is saying that these two angels are standing there going, Remember what he told you in Galilee? Just think back to what he said. And then he quotes him, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. They remembered his words. And they returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. We'll stop reading there. What an exciting story. 
It's not just a story, it's an actual factual account. So Jesus dies, but then he raises from the dead. Let me ask you, what is going to be your reaction today? What is going to be your reaction today? Now, we saw the reaction of a centurion that was closest to Jesus, that looked and said, and glorified God and said, this really is a righteous man. This really is the Son of God. There's no doubt in my mind now. As the sky went black, he thought, Psh, this is something special. We saw the reaction of, of the rest of the crowd as they beat on their chest and they said, I can't believe what I've done. I've made such a big mistake. God, I'm so sorry. But then didn't change anything. So I'm asking you, what are you going to do today? How are you going to react? This morning, as I described to you what happened, maybe it made you a little sad. Maybe it kind of hurt your heart to think about Jesus Christ dying for your sins. No, no, understand, he would have gone through the exact same thing if it were only for you. You say, well, he was dying for billions and billions of people that are going to live from the beginning of time to the end of time. Well, yeah, but he would have still done it if it was just your sins that needed paying for. And so as I described that story and the account, and I described of all the wicked things that was done to Jesus, did it, did it stir up an emotion maybe in your heart that's good. But it did the exact same thing to those people in verse 48. It stirred up a lot of emotions in them. This morning, let's not just feel like we messed up. God, I'm so sorry for my sins. I, I made a mistake. I put Jesus on the cross and then walk out of these church doors and never let it affect or change our lives. You say, oh, well, Brother Stephen, don't worry. I'm already saved. Praise the Lord. But how often does God, in His Word, reveal Himself to us and reveal to us things that we do wrong? And we think to ourselves during some preaching or during, during our personal devotions or, or wherever it is, and whatever it is, we think to ourselves, i got to get that right. I've got to fix that. I messed up. And then we close our Bibles or we walk out of church and we never change a thing. We're sitting in church, we hear the preaching of God's word, and we're broken hearted about our sinful state. And we're broken hearted about how we are and who we are. And we think to ourselves, I've, I'm so messed up, God, help me. We get down on these pews maybe and we pray, God, help me, get, help me get this right, help me fix this. And then we walk out of the, the church and never change a thing. How often does that happen for us saved people? How often, as the pastor of Peakview Baptist Church, I wonder, have I done that? Have I read in God's word something that convicted me? And then thought, well, God, help me get that right. Shut the Bible and I've I got to get to work. i got so much to do. And I never again think about it. But this morning, I'm more worried about those who have never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Understand again, Jesus did die for you. And just feeling bad about it, just acknowledging that, that yeah, he, Jesus is the Son of God, Jesus is a righteous man, yeah, my sins put in there is not good enough to get you to heaven. No, I know. It's a, you, well, I just live a good life then. No, no, the Bible says uh, that we can't earn our way. That there, none of us are going to be able to work our way to heaven because when we get there, God doesn't want anybody to be able to boast about how we got ourselves there. Everyone, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Everyone comes to, gets to heaven, comes to Jesus Christ the same way. So if today you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, just feeling bad about it, just feeling a little convicted about it, doesn't do any good for you. In a minute, we're going to have an invitation, and that's just a big fancy word to me. We're going to invite you. And there's going to be people that are going to come down, and they're going to start praying. And, and I don't want to speak out of turn and, and guarantee that's going to happen, but most likely people are going to just pray and ask God to help them. And, and, but during that time when everybody's kneeling and praying, talking with God, if you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, we would love to have somebody that you're comfortable with take you to one of these two uh, offices and sit you down alone and one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two or however it works to show you from the Bible how you can trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You've got to do something with this emotion that you're feeling right now. I didn't preach that message because I wanted to stir up a bunch of emotions and then send you on your way. I, 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 I preach this message and it's recorded for us because it is supposed to stir up emotions in this and make us realize, I need Jesus. I am sinful and wicked. 
So if you're feeling that way, that's good because you've got to get lost before you can get saved. You've got to acknowledge you need Jesus before you can trust in him. So during this invitation time that we're about to have, I want to encourage you, react correctly today and trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. That, the verse 48, all those people, they just went back to their old lives and many of them died and went to hell because they never changed anything. They felt real bad about what happened to Jesus. They felt real bad about what they did. They felt real bad about watching and, and cheering and mocking but they never fixed any of it. And you can feel real bad this morning, but that doesn't matter. It's not going to matter a hill of beans when you die that you felt bad on, October, or on April 4th, 2021, when you heard the story. What matters is if you get saved. That's the only reaction that's really going to make a difference if you're lost. And if you are saved, your proper reaction ought to be that you realize that whenever God talks to you, you shouldn't just get stirred emotionally and then forget about it. And go on about your daily life. You should get stirred and then change. And allow the Holy Spirit to change you and make you something better than you are now. Feeling bad for what happened to Jesus is not good enough for the lost or the saved. What will your reaction be today? Let's stand together, heads bowed and eyes closed. No one looking around, please. No one talking. Trying to give a private environment in a public setting. If the, if the Holy Spirit has spoke to you this morning, go ahead and get the music playing as soon as you can. And even if I'm talking,